Today on the Matt Wall Show, some states are reportedly considering a race-based distrib- uh, distribution strategy for the vaccine. I- is this another example of anti-white systemic racism? Also, five headlines, including the deadliest epidemic to hit San Francisco this year is not COVID. We'll talk about that. Plus, SNL actors sing and dance together on stage without a mask, yet you still can't walk through the grocery store without a mask. What's the science behind that? And finally, a very somber and personal Daily cancellation today and much more on the Matt Walsh Show. I think one thing this year has us all thinking about is the need to be prepared uh, for whatever life might throw at us, whatever emergencies might uh, befall us. And that's where ReadyWise comes in. You know, we've been telling you about ReadyWise for a long time. And now is a better time than any to be prepared with long-term nutritional food options. ReadyWise has many options like emergency meals, freeze-dried fruits and vegetables for convenient on-the-go nutrition. Uh, They have new adventure meals for hiking and camping. So even if it's not an emergency, but you're out, you know, you're hiking, you're in the woods or something, you want to bring a quick meal, um, uh, which is always a good idea, then you've got ReadyWise for that. ReadyWise makes being prepared simple and affordable. You can order online and have nutritious meals shipped directly to your doorstep. Due to increased demand, supplies are limited. Some items may be out of stock. All that means is that you got to order now. Don't don't waste any time. ReadyWise makes being prepared simple and affordable. You can order online, have nutritious meals shipped directly to your doorstep. When preparing our meals, all you need is four cups of water. It's that simple. The water doesn't even have to be hot. You know, you just uh, simply pour the food into the water, stir and cover. After about 15 minutes, the meal is ready. Couldn't be couldn't be any easier than that. Here's what you need to do. For this, for this, uh, especially this week, my listeners can get free shipping at readywise.com when entering code Walsh at checkout or by calling 855-475-3089. Readywise is a 90-day, no questions asked return policy, so there's no risk taking the initiative to get yourself and your family prepared today. That's readywise, R-E-A-D-Y-W-I-S-E.com, promo code Walsh to get free shipping today. You know, the term systemic racism is, like so many other terms in modern society, used often and loudly and aggressively, despite having no clear meaning. NAACP President Derek Johnson, as quoted in a USA Today article a couple months ago, has defined systemic racism as systems and structures that have procedures or processes that disadvantage African Americans. And if that doesn't clear things up very much, then Glenn Harris, president of a group called Race Forward, has said that systemic racism is the complex interaction of culture, policy, and institutions that hold in place the outcomes we see in our lives. Nearly every definition you find online is like this, vague and circular. You know, how do we know that there's systemic racism? Because of the outcomes we see. Why do we see those outcomes? Because of systemic racism. It should perhaps tell you something that the clearest, though still pretty vague and silly definition for the term that I could track down when I was looking it up, was on the Ben and Jerry's website. The ice cream brand says that systemic racism is racism that infects every structure of our society. Now, I call that the clearest only because it's clearer than systems and structures that have procedures or processes, but it's still completely obscure and by design unfalsifiable. Racism is being located in abstract and unseen places in structures and institutions. The proponents of this theory of systemic racism can't prove that the racism is there, nor can they often point to explicit examples of it, but you can't prove that it's not there. You know, you could provide a lot of very good evidence that the racism isn't there. You know, you could point out, for example, that a black suspect isn't much more likely to be shot during the course of an arrest than a white suspect, and that, in fact, more unarmed white people are shot by cops than unarmed black people. You can, as I have done, go through all of the shootings of unarmed black people in a given year and discover that even in many of those cases, the unarmed suspect was not really unarmed at all, but was in the process of trying to kill police officers or members of the public with a vehicle or was you know, trying to steal an officer's gun or something. You could show that the statistics do not line up with any claim of systemic racism in law enforcement when you look at them in proper context, but that doesn't matter. It will simply be asserted that the racism is there somewhere in the institution, in the system, in the complex interactions, whatever the hell that means. If you don't see it, it's because you don't have enough faith or because you're racist. And that's really what it comes down to. That's the game. If you deny systemic racism, it's because you're racist. You know, you can't deny it without proving it. If you think I'm joking, the website diverseeducation.com in a recent article makes it plain, says, quote, the act of denying racism is inherently racist. 
The, the, the denial is the action that continues to normalize mistreatment and further divides the nation. This is sort of, sort of reminiscent of the old test to find out if somebody's a witch. You know, drown them in the river. If they survive, it's because they're a witch. If they die, well, one less witch to worry about in the world. Now, if I could, I'd like to inject perhaps a little bit of light and clarity into this fog. It seems to me that systemic racism, if it means anything, must mean this. Here's how I would define it. Systemic racism is an explicit mechanism put in place to purposefully provide advantages to one race at the expense of another. Now, I put the qualifiers explicit and purposeful because it's not enough to simply point out that one race is thriving more in a particular system than another. Just because one is thriving more doesn't mean the system was designed for that purpose. If I beat you in a foot race, that doesn't automatically mean that the race was rigged in my favor. But if I beat you in a race where the rule states explicitly that I get to start 50 yards ahead of you, then sure, that would seem to have a lot to do with the outcome. So in order to find systemic racism, we must find a system where it's stated explicitly that certain selected races get an advantage while others don't. Some examples of this kind of systemic racism, that is the real kind, the provable kind, spring immediately to mind. The problem for the left is that they're all examples where the racism goes the other way. Affirmative action, prime example. Here we have a system where the whole point laid out explicitly is to provide advantages to certain races at the expense of others. A white student who doesn't get into a school because his place is given to a minority student with a worse academic record is a victim of systemic racism. Last week on the show, we talked about another more recent, even more dystopian example of systemic racism, but it was at the time theoretical. There were a number of public health experts, as documented in the New York Times, we went over this on Friday, according, uh, who were advocating that the COVID vaccine be distributed according to race, with priority given to groups that are more heavily non-white. As one health and experts, uh, rather health and ethics expert, so he's an expert of health and ethics, as he put it, uh, it's important to level the playing field by putting elderly white people behind racial minorities in line, even though the elderly of any race are far more susceptible to the virus than younger people of any race. That was the proposal. That was the idea. Now we find out that, reportedly, it's actually happening in reality. The Daily Mail has the report. Uh, this is from yesterday. They say, quote, every U.S. state has been advised to consider ethnic minorities as a critical and vulnerable group in their vaccine distribution plans, according to the Centers for Disease Control guidance. As a result, half of the nation's states have outlined plans that now prioritize black, Hispanic, and indigenous residents over white people in some way as the vaccine rollout begins. According to our analysis, this is the Daily Mail again, 25 states have committed to a focus on racial and ethnic communities as they decide which group should be prioritized in receiving coronavirus vaccine doses. Now, just to be clear about it, um, the critical and vulnerable groups when it comes to the coronavirus are the elderly, the obese, those with pre-existing conditions. Those are the critical groups and the groups that have suffered the vast majority of COVID casualties. A young, healthy black man is by no means in any way at greater risk than an 85-year-old in a nursing home, no matter that 85-year-old's race. That's the reality, of course, but we're not dealing in reality here. More from the Daily Mail says the CDC has also issued guidance on its social vulnerability index that uses 15 U.S. census uh, variables to help local officials identify communities that may need to support. It's being used in states such as Michigan, where minority status and language spoken could be taken into consideration when deciding how, a prior how high a priority you are for receiving a vaccine. Maine, in particular, has developed a racial slash ethnic minority COVID-19 vaccination plan in an attempt to give a preference to groups that have experienced rates of disease that, are, that far exceed their representation in the population as a whole. Now, all in all, the mail says California, Hawaii, Idaho, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming all reference black, Hispanic, and indigenous residents, residents as a priority in their COVID vaccine plans. It sounds to me here like we have a system giving advantages to some race over another, or at least that's the intention. Now, whether there actually is any advantage in being the first to get this brand new vaccine, 
is another question altogether. Personally, you know, I wouldn't want to be first in line or second in line or even a millionth in line. I don't plan on being in line at all because I don't plan on taking the vaccine regardless um, as a young and healthy person. That's my own choice. Um, sort of like going back to the affirmative action example, you know, I would be put in last in line for college admissions, but I also happen to have no interest in going to college and I'm quite happy that I don't have the debt to pay off. But that doesn't change what the system is trying to do. And it certainly is not trying to help me as a white male. That's because the system is racist in these cases against me, not for me. Now, I'll be told that this is a good kind of racism. It's a just kind, a justified kind. And I'm a deserving recipient of it. But that, of course, is what the racists always say. You know, it's always a struggle for guys when uh, you start losing your hair. And it happens, it happens to almost everyone at some point as men. It's just, it's one of the burdens we carry, I think, of many, might I add. And, uh, but here's the thing. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a, a tough thing to deal with. But, but here's, here's the great part of it. You don't have to just accept it anymore. Um, you've heard us talking about hymns and how they're helping guys look their best. If you haven't yet, it's time time to see what they're all about. 66% of men start to lose their hair by age 35. Once you've noticed thinning hair, it can be too late to really do everything you can to stop it. The best way to prevent more hair loss is to do something about it while you still have some there. Hims is helping guys be the best version of themselves with licensed medical providers and FDA-approved products to help treat hair loss. These are no, you know, we're not talking snake oil pills or gas station counter supplements. Um, these are prescription solutions backed by science. Hims was created by a guy who knows some men's health conversations are easier, uh, you know, online than in person. No more awkward in-person doctor visits or long pharmacy lines. For Hims connects you to licensed medical professionals online, which could save you hours as well. Completely confidential and discreet. They can answer a few, you know, you answer a few quick questions. Medical professional will, will review all that, and if they determine it's right for you, they could prescribe your medication to treat your hair loss, and it'll be shipped directly to your door. So it's discreet, it's quick, it's private, and you're taking care of the problem all at the same time. Today, Hims is giving you the best offer yet. If you're if you're not happy with your results after 90 days, Hims will give you a full refund. And right now, my listeners can get their first visit absolutely free. Go to forhims.com/walsh. That's forhims.com/walsh. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's forhims.com slash Walsh. Now let's get to our five headlines. So uh, really fascinating and horrifying, but important report here. This is from the Daily Wire. It says the number of uh, San, San Francisco residents who have died from drug overdoses during the past year far exceeds the number who have died from COVID-19. A record high number of uh, 621 people have died from overdoses in 2020 compared to the 173 who've died from COVID-19, according to statistics from the Associated Press. Only 173 people apparently have died in San Francisco from COVID. Uh, in, two, in 2019, 441 people died from drug overdoses in the city, which gives 2020 the grim distinction of having experienced a staggering increase of more than 40%. The overdose statistics of 2019 were a 70% increase from those in 2018. So the numbers keep going up and up. And, and yeah, we know that the uh, drug abuse epidemic in cities like San Francisco didn't start during COVID. We know that it's been on this trajectory all, all, all the while. But when you have a, a city or a society that struggles with these things, and then you say, okay, you got to stay locked in your room for a year, uh, locked in your house. This is what happens. You know, when you, when you, when you put, when, when the, we have decided that the, the number one priority is just to make sure that people continue existing. Quality of life doesn't matter. None of that matters. How much joy you get out of life, that doesn't matter. Having a sense of purpose, that doesn't matter. Just, we're going to, Continue existing. And this is what happens. I just read, there was a, uh, another fascinating thread on Twitter that I just read a moment ago before going on the air. Uh, a, a guy, single guy, talking about the struggles of being a single person during all of this, which is um, something, you know, that's, that's another aspect that those of us who are, aren't single maybe haven't thought much about, but maybe listening to this, you're in the same, you're in the same boat. Or if you're a single person, you know, you don't have a family, and let's say especially... Your, your, your friends and, and extended family 
are, you know, sort of more on the paranoid end of the spectrum when it comes to COVID. And so you're not seeing them much. And so what are you doing? You're not seeing anybody. Maybe you're working from home. You're not seeing your family, you're not seeing your friends. And in terms of romantically trying to find a partner, um, that becomes very difficult to do. So it's just total isolation. Not talking to anybody, not being around anybody. We know that, uh, that you know, the, the liquor stores have done very well because people are spending their time drinking. And in some cases, they're developing hard drug uh, habits at the same time. This is what we get. But this is all being done, right? Remember, if you criticize the lockdowns, it's because you're, you're some sort of sociopath. I would say it's much more the other way around. All right, number two, Dr. Fauci was on CNN this weekend um, taking the important questions. And it's really good to see him focused on issues like this, I think. Um, here he is on, on CNN. Listen. I mean, Elmo is back for something else that I think is on a lot of kids' minds. Elmo's friend has a question about Santa Claus. How did Santa get the vaccine? And is it safe for him to go in the house? How can Santa Claus safely give out presents with COVID-19 spreading everywhere? How can he do it? Will Santa still be able to visit me in coronavirus this season? What if he can't go to anyone's house or near his reindeer? Well, I have to say I took care of that for you because I was worried that you'd all be upset. So what I did a little while ago, I took a trip up there to the North Pole. I went there and I vaccinated Santa Claus myself. I measured his level of immunity and he is good to go. He can come down the chimney. He can leave the presents. He can leave and you have nothing to worry about. Santa Claus is good to go. You know, you could say that this is maybe the most credible thing. The most credible claim we've heard from Fauci is maybe that, that he vaccinated Santa Claus. It's just as credible as much of what else we've heard from him. Although I will say, you know, maybe you don't want your kids to listen to that clip because Santa Claus is supposed to be magical. He shouldn't need a vaccine. Should he? Um, on a more serious note, a woman in Florida, I believe, was at a, a, a she was she was at a library, I think, when somebody called nine one one because she wasn't wearing a mask. Called nine one one, and uh, here's how that interaction happened. Okay, I think it's time for you to wrap up and leave for today. I think coming back another day may be your best option because today is not good. Why? Because you've clearly caused a disturbance and there's an issue. No, they just called because I wouldn't put a mask on. I wasn't causing any disturbance. I wasn't raising my voice. I wasn't yelling at anybody. Okay. That's fine. I wasn't. Okay. Today. I'm not trying to. Okay, get your books. You can check out your books and you can leave. Okay. I'm not breaking any laws. You're about to be if you do not leave. What law would I be breaking? Because you're causing a disturbance. I'm not. In a public place. I'm not causing a disturbance. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. What is your name? I'll give you my name. I'll give you a card. You need to get your son and check out your books and you can come back but another day. This is not a good example. L listen, how how is this going to be documented? Because I was not causing a disturbance. It's gonna, there's going to be a report done. Ma'am, there's going to be a report, and you can get a report number, and you can take it to your attorney. But I was not causing Please get your stuff. Please get your stuff before you get trespassed. Now, did you hear there's someone in the background? You're not, you're, it's a bad example for your child. You're setting a bad example. No, I would say um, if you're calling the police on someone because they're not wearing a mask and you're scared, you're scared, you're the one setting a bad example. You absolute. Imagine what kind of coward you have to be. There's a woman sitting at the library, and you're so afraid you're huddled behind a desk calling, someone get over here quick, get here. She's going to kill us all. Just get, just stay away from her if you're afraid. Is it that hard to do? I mean, that library didn't seem that crowded to me. So if she's sitting on a, a table at the library, there's nobody around. If you're afraid, just avoid her. No problem. I mean, do you think if you're 100 feet away in another, you know, in the nonfiction section, well, she's over there in the, in the children's section. You, what, you, you think the, tra the virus is going to travel all that way and infect you? Absolutely pathetic. 
I uh, of all the the villains that have come to the surface during this um, entire crisis crisis uh, brought on you know self-made in many ways um, of all the villains I have to put number one even above the petty tyrants and government number one are the, just the, the American citizens who are calling the police on their own on their on their fellow citizens on business owners or just moms at the library not wearing a mask those to me are those are bad guy that's bad guy number one right there someone doing that all right number three SNL speaking of masks SNL had its holiday episode um, this weekend. Kristen Wiig was hosting, and her her opening bit was about as funny as anything else SNL has produced in the past decade, which is to say it was not funny at all. But the lack of humor isn't really the thing I'm focusing on here. Um, let's just watch a, a quick clip of this. These are the actual real words, okay? Cream-colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You, you, you have a beautiful singing voice, Thank but you. those, those words were crazy. That's not crazy. That's not, that's not cool what you just did. No, that's, it's not okay. No, I'm cream colored ponies? I'm just gonna say it, that sounds racist. Yes, and I don't know if I'm allowed to agree with you, but I do. Yeah, you do. Yes. Because yes. it's racist. Yes. Uh, I, I just, I'm blown away by how unfunny this is. I mean, they're professional writers at SNL. And this is what they come up with. What, what even is, so the joke is just, that, that was a whole joke. That was a whole bit. By the way, this goes on for like 75 minutes, it feels like. And the whole bit is just they take turns singing the song the wrong way. This is what you come up with? Professional comedy writers? Hey, you know what would be funny? Let's have them all come up there and, and uh, you know, that, 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 that song, they should sing it the wrong way. That'll be funny. That's what they come up with. But on top of that, let's put that to the side. Uh, we're used to SNL being aggressively unfunny all the time. N- none of them wearing masks. They're closer than six feet next to each other. They're singing, you know, projecting their spittle forward and no mask. And to make it even more absurd. So if you, if you, if you notice there, you've got the three women who are singing, no mask. And then you've got, you got the, the, the band in the background. And most of them aren't wearing masks, except there's one, there's one woman. I don't know what, she, what, what instrument she's playing, but she's all the way in the back, and she is wearing a mask. What's the point of that? What's the point of having a whole stage of people, people singing, you know, playing the saxophone, and uh, no one's wearing a mask, and then you've got one person wear, randomly wearing a mask? What, what good does that do at that point? Uh, we all know it's for show, of course. But I'm just wondering, what's the science behind this? So if I, well, forget about me. Let's, the woman we just played, she was at the library. So she's at the library sitting, you know, many feet away from the next person on her own at her own table. And, uh, and she's such a danger to the public. She has to be escorted out of the library by the police. And yet these women can be right next to each other singing and everything and dancing and no mask. What, what's the science behind that? What's the science that would explain how the one at the library is a threat to the public, but those people aren't? Where's the science there? Or if I'm just walking through the grocery store, not talking to anybody. I walk in, I get my stuff, I leave, never talk to a single person, which is what I would do at the grocery store, COVID or not, as an antisocial person. But, um, and yet I have to wear a mask, but they don't. Well, the science is, of course, here's the science. Um, They are better than me and you, or at least they think they are. That's the science. I think maybe we can all agree, but well, we can't agree on much in society anymore. Maybe this is the only thing we can, we can agree on. Uh, no, acne is bad. Nobody wants acne. That's, uh, there, are, there are very few pro-acne people out there, uh, yet lots of people get it. And uh, what are you going to do once you have it? Well, proactive. That's what you're going to do. Proactive combines gentle skin care paired with the best acne treatment for your skin. Proactive has three different systems designed for your skin type. No matter what type of breakout you're dealing with, Proactive combines gentle skin care paired with the best acne treatment for you. So they basically got three systems uh, to dif- differentiate between, you know, skin type and, and, and what sort of breakout you're dealing with. They've got Proactive MD Advanced. This is a prescription strength for stubborn breakouts. They've got Proactive Plus Gentle. This is for the more gentle sort of skin types. And then Proactive Solution Original. This is the original system, and this is for all skin types, and it's just kind of 
Uh, it works for everybody. With clinically proven ingredients and tested by dermatologists, you're getting all of this. You're getting a simple three-step system designed for you. And you can, it's really simple. You subscribe to consistently clear skin. If you want your skin to clear up, Proactive is the way to go. Right now is a great time to try Proactive. For my podcast listeners, you can get a special offer available by going to proactive.com slash Walsh. Proactive subscribers will receive the Hydrating Duo as a free gift. That includes four hydrogel masks and the green tea moisturizer. You're getting all that free. You're also getting free shipping. Again, visit proactive.com slash Walsh to take advantage of this special offer now. That's proactive.com slash Walsh and subscribe to Clear Skin. Um, Let's see, this is from ktla.com. It says, San Francisco public schools won't reopen for in-person learning in January because of a breakdown in negotiations between the school district and teachers unions over coronavirus safety. Uh, The district said in an online statement, the district cannot meet all of the new requirements that the labor unions have proposed, and there is not sufficient time to complete bargaining in order to reopen any school sites on January 25th. So they're not going to reopen. And remember, we just played, we just, uh, we just talked about a few minutes ago, San Francisco and their COVID death numbers. They've got more people dying of of drug abuse than they do of COVID. Yet they're not going to reopen the schools. So we're, we're ranking the villains from the COVID crisis. And I just said, number one, right? People calling the police on their fellow Americans. Yeah, they are number one. Um, Teachers unions though, really, really competing for that top spot. Talk about cowardice. The cowardice that not all, but many teachers have displayed during all of this is uh, really pretty extraordinary. Number five, huge controversy here. The Lakers played their um, final preseason game on Saturday, and Anthony Davis was spotted on the bench clipping his toenails um, right there in the arena. You could see the picture of it during the game. And he's just clipping his toenails in front of everybody. Now, he's got a towel down. This is a big controversy, and it should be. And this, you know, for me, this is why I've always said that all types of public grooming should be banned. Clipping toenails or fingernails, that's just, you're a a psychopath if you're doing that. But anything. You you see people cleaning their teeth. I remember not long ago, I was out in public and I saw someone, I think maybe I was at a coffee shop, and I saw someone flossing, just sitting at a table flossing. You know, that... Q-tip, anything involving Q-tips, all of that, unconstitutional and uh, should be banned. One of the most important things we have are our memories, you know, especially our memories, our old family memories, the things we're nostalgic for. Um, But the problem is maybe you have some of those memories stored on aging tapes, film, photos, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, those things are stuffed away in a box somewhere. They can easily be damaged or destroyed. That's why you need Legacy Box. Legacy Box is an effortless way to have your aging tapes, films, and photos digitally preserved on a modern format so they're safe for generations. So many of us have irreplaceable moments on tapes and films and film reels that we can no longer watch. You know, maybe you you just don't don't have that antiquated technology anymore to watch it. That's why you need Legacy Box. With Legacy Box, you can reclaim all that priceless footage you haven't been able to see for years. The service couldn't be simpler. You, you use their kit, kit to safely send the moments that you want to preserve. Their team will create a digital archive by hand, and then you'll receive your new copies stored on the cloud, a thumb drive on the DVD, however you want it. They're going to send it to you along with all the original media you sent them. So you're getting all that back uh, if you want to, you know, just as a keepsake or something, but you, you're also going to have those memories accessible and safe forever. With our tracking system, you can monitor every step of the process as you, so you always know that your originals are being taken care of. And uh, I've done this myself, and the thing that impressed me was how easy and simple it was. I mean, literally, you're just taking all the stuff, you're putting it in a box, you're shipping it to them. They're doing all the hard stuff and then sending it back to you. Uh, that's what I like. That's what I like it when there's almost nothing for me to do. And that's the case here. Go to legacybox.com slash Walsh to take advantage of this limited time offer and get 50% off. Take advantage of this exclusive offer today and then use their kit now and send it in whenever you're ready. Go to legacybox.com slash Walsh and save 50% while supplies last. Well, um, one other note here. Daily Wire is excited to announce that the historical docuseries Apollo 11, What We Saw, is now available exclusively for Daily Wire members. We were telling you about this all last week, and now, now you can go watch it. Originally released as an audio podcast for Apple and Spotify, What We Saw takes a detailed look at the Apollo 11 mission to land a man on the moon. Uh, 
Now, Apollo 11, what we saw is available to watch as well as listen over at dailywire.com or on Apple TV or Roku app. This series is just one piece of the of all the new content that we've got coming down the pipeline, including a new show uh, with Candace Owens. We've got the entire PragerU library. We've got a new entertainment channel. Uh, we're going to have a new investigative journalism team. That and much more. But you got to become a Daily Wire insider or above member for 20% off with code WATCH over at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Let's get now to our daily cancellation. Today for our daily cancellation, it brings me great pain to do this. Uh, as a father, it's the last thing I ever want to do, but I'm afraid I must today cancel my one-year-old daughter. Um, I'd always imagine that her time, her first time to be canceled would come a little bit later in life. My oldest, the twins, were canceled for their first time around the age of six. So it's hard to look at your youngest child, your baby girl, and realize that she must be canceled, especially at such a tender age. But it is, um, it's out of my hands. Now, for some background, uh, my daughter, Emma, just very recently started walking. And I could almost cancel her just for that because children become much harder to deal with once they have full use of their legs. You know, you can, you can always tell the first-time parents because they're the ones trying to coax their kids to walk at like nine months and getting very excited about, oh, you got to walk. More experienced veteran parents know, you know, we know what lies ahead once walking sets in. So we encourage our kids to take their time. We say, hey, you don't want to start walking until 18 months or so? No problem. Just take it easy down there. No pressure at all. The problem is that once they start walking, you know, they can move around more and quicker and they can reach things. So last night, for example, my wife was out. I was making dinner and um, Emma was just walking around the living room, grabbing everything she could and tossing it on the floor. She grabbed a desk lamp at one point and literally spiked it on the ground like a football and then waddled over to the coffee table, chucked a cup full of soda halfway across the room. And they know what they're doing too. She took that cup in her hand, threw it, and then looked at me like, yeah, do something about it. What are you going to do? That's what I thought, punk. This is what you have to look forward to when they walk. That's why my favorite phase of childhood is, is when they're right between newborn infancy and crawling. If that's it. That's a sweet spot. There's a span of several weeks when they can't move much, but will sort of flop and scoot around on the ground like a little walrus or maybe like, like a sea cucumber on the ocean floor. This is enough movement to keep them entertained so they aren't crying, but not enough to make them any kind of a serious flight risk. So you can set them down on the ground, sit on the couch with a beer, and just watch them roll around for 45 minutes without ever making it out of the room. These are the moments to cherish. You know, walking is massively overrated in my experience, but none of that is the reason for my daughter's cancellation. The reason can be seen in this incriminating video, which my wife took and posted online for some reason. We went to the botanical gardens here in the city. You know, that must have been my idea to go spend our weekend there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we were walking around outside. Little Emma was doing more walking than she'd ever done before. And uh, this is a clip my wife took and posted somehow proudly. There she is walking along the path. But look at that arrow on the sidewalk. My daughter's walking in the wrong direction on the sidewalk. They have arrows on the sidewalk at the botanical gardens outside telling us what direction we can walk so as not to infect one another with the virus. My daughter's going the wrong way, endangering millions of lives in the process. I have never been so ashamed as a parent. Now, you might ask, why are they making their sidewalks into one-way paths when they're clearly wide enough for two people to pass. Also, are you really more likely to give somebody the virus while walking past them in the opposite direction than you are if you walk past them going the same direction? In fact, you might ask, when you pass someone who's going the same direction, aren't you likely to spend more time in their proximity than you are if you pass from opposite directions? Because, you know, when you pass going the same way, there's always that awkward moment where 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 you're walking side by side and, you know, one of you has to speed up, the other one slow down. And besides, Is there any reason to think that the virus is at all being transmitted between people outside who merely pass by one another briefly? And considering that everybody at the gardens was wearing a mask, everyone I mean except for my family, shouldn't we be even less concerned about transmission if masks do in fact work? These are all good questions. Sort of like the questions you might ask about why you have to remain socially distant while boarding a plane, only to be seated in the same metal tube with these people for six hours. 
Many anti-COVID measures have been adopted both voluntarily and mandatorily, which appear to have no reason or justification behind them. That's all true. But we're not supposed to be asking those questions. Just do as you're told. Wear the mask, follow the arrow, trust the protocols. My daughter, in a brazen act of disregard for her fellow man, did not follow the arrows or trust the protocols. And many lives have no doubt been lost due to her recklessness. And she's not even wearing a mask on top of it. Like I said, none of us were, but she should really be setting an example. Shameful. Absolutely shameful. So she is canceled today. And hopefully she has uh, learned her lesson from this experience. Remember, follow the arrows on the sidewalk. It will keep you alive. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodowski. The show is edited by Danny D'Amico. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Nika Geneva. And production assistant, McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. Mm-hmm.